morning. Good to see everybody today. Something's not... Now it is. Woo! All right. That'll wake you up a little bit. You don't need any more coffee. Okay, God's faithful here today on Super Bowl Sunday, huh? <laughs> Joking. I mean, you are faithful. Praise God for today. Uh, I want to welcome our, our guests who are visiting with us today. Um, if you have a moment to fill out an attendance card we have on the back table, we would love to have record of your attendance so we can invite you to things coming up here at the church we have going on throughout the year. And uh, on the 18th of this month, I wanted to remind us, we have our uh, Sweethearts Banquet, and there's still tickets available, fortunately, for you. Uh, if you want to see... I think Samantha Morris would be the person to see about that after service. She can get you some tickets, and we'd love to have you come on out and um, enjoy some fellowship with us on the 18th. So you can see today we're talking about divine provision, and there's a story of a woman who was, uh, had a doctor's appointment early in the afternoon, and of course, you know how when you go to the doctor's office, they keep you waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and her appointment was running late, and by that time, she was just a little bit flustered. Uh, she had uh, many things to do that afternoon. She had to um, get her pre prescriptions filled that the doctor uh, prescribed her. She had to pick up the children, her children from school, uh, her son and daughter, and take the boy to soccer practice and the uh, daughter to uh, dance rehearsal. And before all that, she needed to go to the mall to take her daughter's dress to be um, uh, fitted for her recital in the next few weeks. And as soon as she pulled into the mall parking lot, it started just a torrential rain started to come, just pouring down rain, and she couldn't find any parking spots in the mall. Yeah, we don't know how that is, do we? All right. She's driving around, it's pouring down rain, she's flustered, she's becoming a little more angry, and she starts to pray. She says, God, I, I'm in a real spot here, I'm, I'm pressed for time, and I've got this going on, this, and then she's rattling off this prayer, and all of a sudden, by the front door of the mall, a car began to back out of a parking spot right by the front door. And she zipped in there real quick and interrupted herself in a prayer and said, God, never mind, something just opened up for me. <laughs> Divine provision can be a funny thing. Oftentimes, we get distracted and we get sidetracked and we talk to God uh, God does provide for us, but we're so flustered with the things that are happening right around us that we fail to recognize what it is He's providing. It's right there in front of us. Um, today we're going to be looking at a story about divine provision, as I noted just a moment ago. It's in Genesis chapter 22. And I invite you, if you have your Bibles with you today, turn to Genesis chapter 22 with me. We'll be getting there in a moment. If you don't have a Bible, there should be some in the pew around you. It'd be great for you to look at the Bible today and read it with us. Some of you are familiar with this story, Genesis chapter 22. Um, it's, it's pretty out there. It's tough. Uh, it's a hard one to preach sometimes. Um, it's the text of God telling Abraham to go kill his child, to sacrifice his child, and then burn him as an offering. Yeah. That's really out there, I understand. So what I want to do today is preface the sermon with this, um, because sometimes words can be misconstrued, and sometimes people don't understand what you're saying, even though uh, it, you think you're being very clear about things. But in no way does this text condone child sacrifice, <laughs> okay? I want to make that clear. God doesn't condone killing other people. Okay, that's not what God is doing here in this text. So I wanted to say that up front so you won't misunderstand what we're reading today. Okay? So I'm also going to tell you what this text is about right up front. And it's about this. Provision. God will always provide. God will always provide. God will always provide. He'll provide for us in our time of need, in our time of travel, when we need to get active, He'll provide a thought for us to cling to when fear and anxiety is present. He'll provide an idea that challenges our thinking when we need it most. He'll provide an escape in time of temptation, a home when we have no family, a Savior when we need saving. Amen. He's already done that, hasn't He? 
He's done that through Jesus Christ. And we'll look at that in a little bit. But first, I'd like to look at Genesis chapter 22, particularly verses 1 and 2. It says this, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Here in just a second, we're going to look at three dimensions of this text. And we'll split it up into three sections so we can kind of understand what's going on here. We're first going to look at God's command, what God's telling Abraham to do. Then we're going to look at Abraham's response to God's command, how Abraham responds to God. And then we're going to look specifically at God's provision, how he provides for his servant in this most difficult situation. But first, I want to look at God's command. Okay. So, if we pay close attention to the text in chapter 22, verse 1, we see this introductory phrase that says, sometime later. Now, when we're reading our Bibles, it's extremely important for us to pay attention to the context in which we find the story we're reading about. I don't know how many times I need to repeat that or how many times I need to enunciate this. Context is everything. It really informs us about the story we're reading at the time. Okay? So if we take the context of this story in chapter 22 we're about to read about, in, in full view, we'll learn about God's activity up to this point, and we'll also learn about Abraham's activity up to this point. When we learn about God, we learn in chapter 12, verse 1, that God calls Abraham. He calls him out. He says, Abraham, come over here to me. I need you to do something for me. I need you to leave your country, your home, your father's home, the place where you're most comfortable. I need you to step outside your boundaries and go this way. And Abraham obeys. He follows God where God leads. We know that about them at this point. And when we continue the narrative, we read about God's relationship with Abram. We'll also read that God protects Abraham and provides for him and blesses him bountifully. He helps Abraham in the fight for his nephew Lot. And he establishes a covenant with Abraham. In other words, God really cares and loves Abraham. Cares for and loves Abraham. He establishes a covenant with Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Provide a huge blessing for you. And people throughout all the world will be blessed because of your name. We learn about that in chapter 15 and chapter 17. He says, it's going to happen through a son. I'm going to give you a son. Now, Abraham, you remember, we read about this last week. He was an old guy. He was almost reaching 100 years old when Isaac was born, his son, who we're reading about today. But in chapter 18, God tells Abraham and Sarah that he's going to have a son at this old age. And it happens. So Abraham knows that God is powerful. Abraham knows that God works. Abraham knows that God is intentional and he's doing things in his life. He has seen his activity, so he knows God is going somewhere with this. Also in chapter 22, verse 1, we read that God tested Abraham. (sighs) I don't like being tested. Do you? No, probably not. Unless you're some kind of weird person. Which we're all weird persons, I guess, in some way. But if you like being tested, eh. It's like if you don't like the Beatles. I don't know, something. (laughs) Some people are like, what? We can still be friends, I promise. God tested Abraham. We see that. That's what we learn about in this very short verse. You know, it's a rhetorical device that's kind of cushioning us for this graphic story to come. Repugnant story. Repulsive, really. But it's also informing us about the character of God. He tests His people. That's what He does. James chapter 1 tells us He doesn't tempt us, but He tests us. It's important that we know who we're dealing with when we deal with God. Because He's not capricious. He's not harmful in His testing. He wants to show us who we really are and who He really is. And that's what's going on with Abraham. So He gives him this command, this instruction. He says, take your son, 
the son you love, your only son. When he says your only son, we know that Ishmael's already been born, but Ishmael's gone at this point. So this is really his only son, whom he loves, Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I need you to sacrifice your son as a burnt offering. Okay, so, you know, I've got to be honest, I've never actually preached this text before. I've been preaching a long time, and I've stayed away from this text for a clear reason. Because it's just extremely radical. And it crazy, really. I'll just go ahead and say it. But see, it seems outrageous to our mind that God would say something like this to Abraham. It's that the modern mind just can't really wrap their mind around this activity. But in antiquity, it was very, very different. In the ancient Near East, they did things very, very differently, in fact. We read about the history of religions. You can go home and Google this kind of stuff and read about it. There are all kinds of gods back in the day. Back in Abraham's day. In fact, we read about Abraham in chapter 12, 1, being called from this multiplicity world of gods. He was surrounded by people who believed in other gods, who desired, people believe, sacrifice. And I'll try to explain it to you like this. It was never enough. So, if it was, say you're a farmer, okay, and you needed it to rain. Well, you needed to pray to the rain god. So what you do is you get a little grain and burn it and offer it to the gods and say, oh, I need to rain, I need to rain, I need to rain. I don't know if they did it like that, but it was something like that. And it didn't rain. So I scratch your head and think, oh, let's give more grain. Maybe more. Okay, so you get more grain, still no rain. Ah, the grain's not working. Let's get a few birds, throw a couple of birds on the pit. Not working. What about some cows, some sheep, some lamb? Not enough. Well, what is enough? We need something very valuable. Our children. How about that? Will the gods respond to that? And then maybe at some point in time, you can look back into history, a child was sacrificed and it actually did rain, coincidentally. And what's in their mind? Well, this is what the gods like. So in order to thank the gods and praise the gods, we should sacrifice another child. Now, that's just, in our minds, radical. But in their minds, it was not so radical. In fact, in ancient Israel, we see threads of this belief leaking over into Israelite culture. That's why when we read in Leviticus chapter 20, God prohibits this type of activity. He says uh, to Moses, Say to the Israelites, any Israelite or any foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Moloch is to be put to death. Now, why would God say that? So, t- talk to him. It's okay. It was happening because people were actually doing it. So, child sacrifice, and this is long after Moses, too, a few generations. So, this was happening in ancient Israel. And just, just for, you know, um, um, history's sake, Moloch is a god of the Ammonites. And also the Canaanites worshipped Moloch too. He's a god of protection. So Abraham probably would have been familiar with this god. But what I'm trying to get us to see is this was not so uncommon for them. In fact, for some time, even when we read up into the the book of 2 Kings, last year we looked at King Ahaz in 2 Kings chapter 16. He sacrificed his child. To the gods. So God's command to Abraham would have been confusing in the sense that God uh, has already shown Abraham that he wasn't like these other gods. He wasn't trying to be like these other gods. But it wasn't a foreign concept to Abraham. You see where I'm going with this? God's dealing, however, with Abraham up until this point in the narrative, if we take the context all the way to chapter 22 will understand that Abraham's interaction with God should inform him about God has a purpose, about God's purpose, and he's going somewhere with this. You know, I remember driving um, in, in 14 when we moved out to California. We had, I kind of frame it like this. We had the command, go to California, okay, my wife and I, our cat Ulysses. <laughs> so we got an automobile, and then we drove and drove and drove. And then we hit West Texas. Bob. <laughs> and I know y'all are laughing right now, because what is in West Texas, right? Nothing. 
There's nothing in West Texas. It's just a lot of land, you know. And I'm thinking the whole time, um, you know, if I had never, I was thinking, where's a gas station, right? But if, I, if I'd never actually had any interaction with an automobile or the roads, I didn't know how this, uh, this, this process was of moving from one place to the other. Um, if I didn't know how that was and had experience with that, uh, you know, I would be thinking that there's never going to be a gas station anywhere around us. We're all going to die. Yeah? But see, my interaction with the vehicle and the roads informed me that there was, it was coming. Fuel was on its way. There was provision to come. You understand? That's the thing, what we're reading about here is Abraham's learning. God will always provide. God will always provide. Come on, God will always provide. Once he had that command, he's knowing, he's going to know, he's about to know, God's provision is on its way. And now we're going to read about how Abraham responds to that command right here. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Excuse me, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over here, over there, rather. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him up on the altar, on top of the wood, and he reached out his hand and took the knife and slay, to slay his son. So this is very dramatic. It's a build-up here. So you see Abraham's response. Abraham is obedient to what God's saying to do. Even though that's really wacky, you know, in our minds, it probably is to him as well, to some degree. But his initial response, when we read chapter 22, verse 1, is, I'm present, God. Here I am. When God calls Abraham, he says, here I am. What do you need me to do? What do you want me to do, God? He's present for God's divine activity. He makes himself present for God. Unlike some characters in Genesis chapter 3 we read about. You remember that where God says, where are you? They were hiding Adam and Eve because they knew they had sinned. Abraham put himself in front of God and said, here I am. I'm ready. And we also, too, read about in chapter 22 this initial obedience from Abraham. I mean, without hesitation, Abraham gears up. He's ready to go. And what's strange is, you know, during this three-day journey, and even at the arrival, you know he had to have some kind of emotional whiplash, some kind of severe emotional heaviness riding on him. You know what I mean? I mean, even though he was accustomed to the child sacrifice in these pagan cultures, even though there was a very difficult life for them, you know, years and years and years ago, he was still his son, and still he loved his son. And why is God asking me to do this? I don't know, I guess, but I'm going with you, God, is what Abraham says. And if you see his activity here, there's really no uh, insight as to what he's thinking in the text. His, his activity appears robotic. It's automated in a way. He's just going through the motions. Even the dialogue between Isaac and Abraham seems robotic. It's automated. But, it's when we get to verse 8 in chapter 22 that we see something very revealing about Abraham. He says, God himself will provide. Despite whatever Abraham was going through at that time, despite this very severe and heavy situation, surrounded with conflict and anxiety and probably fear that all of us encounter at some point during the week and during the day. Amen? When we're in the midst of those things, we need to take note from Abraham and recognize that he knew and had faith and believed that in the midst of all that, God will provide. That's what God does. And he will rectify the situation. If it looks bad, it can get better. 
because God's in the business of making things better. Amen? That's what God does. The text is a little ambiguous about Abraham's character and his thought here. Nice rhetorical device, probably. But the author of Hebrews in chapter 11, very clear about what's going on in Abraham's mind. He says this, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise from the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. You see, Abraham's response of obedience was really informed by God's character that he's dealt with up until this point in his life. God had never let him down up to this point. Amen? God provided for him all along this way. And he knew if he's going to take him here, if he's going to get him in the middle of this mess, God's going to get him out of it. Amen? This is critical. It's critical to see this. Abraham had faith that God could accomplish the unthinkable. He could unlock the reality that we cannot see and be a part of. He's created that for us. He's God, and he's invited us into that. Abraham knew that into this realm past sickness and disease and anxiety and fear and death. God gives us something more. He's promised that. God will always provide. God will always provide. God will always provide. And we see the third dimension of this story. Full effect. It's what we're talking about. God's provision. It says this in chapter 22, verses 10 and following. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel said, to the, uh, said the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied, Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain, the Lord, of the Lord, it will be provided. We see God's provision in full view here. And before we see the provision, we see somewhat of an intervention, a divine intervention. You see, Abraham was headed down this path. It's a scary path, it was a treacherous path. But it was a path that God was leading him down nonetheless. He was obedient to God. And, and Abraham and God had this relationship where God... He knew Abraham was going to go. He wanted to see where he was going to go, and he went. And before he went through with it, this murder, God said, no. I'm with you, and I will provide for you. God intervenes because Abraham had been obedient all the way up to that time. You know, oftentimes in our own lives, we need intervention ourselves, don't we? Amen. Sometimes we need it in a big, big way. Amen? When we are obedient to God and we are moving within His realm and following what He provides for us, He will intervene in those critical moments. That's what He does. He intervenes and He provides. That's what we see in the story of Abraham here. When God tests us, which He will test, and that's okay. It's okay to come to terms with that, accept that, love that. When he tests, he will provide as well. That's what God does. And we read at the end of the chapter 22 here, God providing this foresight, this imagination, if you will, of what will be, what could be. All Abraham has to do is keep on moving in that direction. You see, God's ultimate provision for his people is to provide life. That's what he wants to do. In any Christian preaching that looks at the Old Testament text, we view, we view the text itself through the prism of Jesus Christ. If you wanted to, you could take the text in, in Genesis chapter 22 and start making all kinds of comparisons to the life of Jesus himself in the sacrifice of God's only Son. 
But the difference between Abraham's story and the story of Jesus is that we really do find salvation in Jesus. God provides salvation through Jesus Christ. But like Abe, if we follow where God leads, we're going to experience uh, that full provision that God provides through Jesus. And it's very, very important for us to remember this point I'm going to leave us on here. God always provides. God will always provide through Jesus Christ. Now, I, I, want, to, I want to tag that. I want to, make sure, I want to make sure I'm preaching Jesus Christ today. Amen? I want you to hear that. Hear the proclaimed word of God that Jesus Christ died for your sins. When we come to God and we're obedient to God and we follow his directives, we have no choice but to come to Jesus. That's where all roads lead to Jesus. And praise him for that. Because my roads, if, I, if I'm building them, they're dark. I don't have a GPS. I'm scared. And I don't know where I'm going. God provides us a way to go through Jesus Christ. This morning, if you need help getting back to God's provision and experiencing everything He has for you in your life, if you need help connecting, I'm going to ask you to come forward and we can pray with you this time. And if you haven't been baptized into the kingdom to receive that full salvation that's only provided through Jesus Christ, now's the time to come forward. Will you come as we stand and sing? Oh, <laughs>